Welcome to Sisters in Crime Australia and Murder Monday, when authors talk about their crime craft. I'm Karina Kilmore. I'm a debut crime writer, a journalist and a national convener for Sisters in Crime. And we've been celebrating women's crime writing since 1991. Before I introduce Michelle Laurie, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. Michelle, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for having me. That's a beautiful acknowledgement of country that you do. It's lovely. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me introduce you. Not that you really need any, but... <laughs> I'm sure I do, to some. You've come a long way from your hometown of Toowoomba. Since yeah. then, you've had an amazing career as a comedian and broadcaster. You've appeared on Spicks and Specs, Good News Week, Rove and The Project. While on Radio Kiss 101.1, you've co-hosted Matt and Michelle with Matt Tilly and the 3pm Pickup. You're also a prolific writer, writing a large range of publications, including Mamma Mia, as well as your books. But these days, you're probably better known for your hugely successful podcast, Australian True Crime co-produced with well-known Sisters in Crime member, Emily Webb. Your podcast has been downloaded nearly 50 million times. And apparently your interest in true crime was originally sparked when you worked as a receptionist at a Melbourne brothel and came across Australian serial killer, Peter Dupas. You also haven't come to, uh, you also haven't come to true crime writing empty-handed because you've trained and volunteered in trauma and palliative care. And you're also a tireless charity worker and mum of 11 year old twins. Before we start with the questions, can you please give us the elevator pitch for your latest book, CSI Told You Lies, giving victims a voice through forensics? Sure, I, I've got a copy here so you can see the cover. I love the cover so much. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Pe Penguin are just so beautiful. I love working with them. Uh, it was entirely their construction. Yeah, I and love they sent, it. Sent me a, yeah, they sent me an email saying, oh, what do you think about this? And I was dazzled. Yeah. I love it so much. Beautiful. It's embossed and everything. It's Ooh. lovely. I love so look, CSI Told You Lies, the title comes from the fact that uh, when I was interviewing and well, even before interviewing, when I was getting to know the forensic pathologists at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, uh, which is the um, coroner's court and the mortuary, that's the building here in Melbourne where the forensic pathologists work and they do the autopsies and post-mortem examinations and all the DNA testing and all of that stuff. Every time you talk to anyone associated with that work, I swear every single time one of them will say, it's not like CSI, is it? And they're very self-conscious of <laughs> how different their work is from what we see in television, in movies, and even read in fiction. And I, I, I sort of laughed it off for a very long time. And we'd make jokes about how they're not wearing leather jackets and they're not having affairs with each other in between autopsies. And, um, <laughs> but then when I started researching it, I found this thing called the CSI effect uh, that was, that that term was coined by uh, um, a group in the States. It was a study done by a university that found that people who read about and watch a lot of television about crime develop this idea that they or I should say we know so much about forensics that we can make up our own minds even in a court setting so what they found was that it was really affecting juries all this proliferation of forensics in popular culture was affecting juries and some jurors were making up their own minds about scientific evidence and and maybe even disbelieving professionals when they gave evidence <laughs> jury members were saying to themselves I don't reckon when they were hearing professionals give evidence they're making up their own minds about it so it's it's had a profound effect actually on on uh, on the legal proceedings That's it's very fascinating. frustrating mm. it's very frustrating for professionals mm. they know now that when they go into a court setting not only do they have to try and explain sometimes quite complicated 
biological concepts to lay people. But sometimes they won't even be believed by these lay people. The lay people will say, mm, well, I mean, that's what you think. But <laughs> <laughs> I beg to differ, doctor, professor. So uh, that's where the title comes from. And uh, that's what the book is about, a, a couple of cases and big cases in Australia and the actual forensic pathologists who worked on those cases and how their work was crucial to maybe the solving of the cases or sort of moving the cases forward. Or in some cases, it's about uh, DVI, which is disaster victim identification, where they went into situations like the tsunami, Boxing Day tsunami, or the bushfires, um, Black Saturday bushfires, mm. or MH17. Yeah, we had one specialist who went to the Netherlands and assisted, was part of the, the international team who um, identified the victims of the MH17 crash. I'll call it a crash, even though it was actually shot down, that aircraft. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Mm. Very um, hard work. Well, let's it is, get but to... that one, that chapter in particular is very special because the Maslins, Rin and Maz worked on the chapter with me very closely. We effectively wrote it together because every word of it went to them for editing and... Um, yeah, for them to sign off on. So, yeah, very special. Yeah. Well, let me shuffle the cards, Michelle. Oh, and, we shuffle them. Like let's, tarot yes, reading. That's right. <laughs> we just right. Set them fall where they fall. <laughs> lay my hands on them. <laughs> okay. Here's a well leading on from what I we're just it. talking about. Yes, yeah, sure. How do you write about violence? I always tried to when writing about violence I always try to think about the purpose behind what I'm writing so it's always about treading that line between how much violence to divulge isn't it it's a, it's always about because I I never want to leave all the violence out because I think the purpose of it is to to talk about what happened honestly and I've, I've spoken about this to victims families and, and overwhelmingly, they say, yeah, we don't want to sanitise it. We don't want to over-sanitise it because that happened to my family member. And I don't want people to forget that. I don't want it to be whitewashed, glossed over. As much as we don't want to make entertainment of it, I don't similarly want to pretend it didn't happen so that's that's the line that you walk but always I'm trying to think okay what's the purpose what is the purpose of of telling this story at all and then what's the purpose of divulging these details sometimes I'll tell the same story differently in different contexts because in this context there's a purpose behind giving those details in this context there's no purpose at all to be served so I don't. And in this book in particular, uh, I talk about Natalie Russell, who was one of the victims of the Frankston serial killer and uh, Paul Denyer. In some contexts, I've spoken and left details out about her autopsy. In this context, the details are left in because they're very specific to this story and very specific to the way in which he was stopped the evidence that was gathered from her autopsy was significant, very significant in his capture and conviction. Yeah. Well, how do you write about sex, sex crime, you know? Yes, again, that's, it's always about the dignity of the victim. In this case, there are, there's at least one case that I left the details of a sex attack out because I didn't feel like they were necessary to the story. Yeah. So yeah, again, it, it's all about the context and generally about the uh, consent of the victim. In this case, the victim was murdered and so can't give consent. And yeah, I didn't feel it was Im important to the the telling of the overall story. So, yeah. yeah. 
what research did you have to do for your latest book? Oh, tons, tons, tons. <laughs> uh, and that was interesting because my previous books were about Buddhism. Yes. And so, <laughs> and like there was a lot of research in that as well because my previous books were about sort of taking a situation in the first case, a breakup. So I always wanted to write books about Buddhism, but it's such a huge topic. So then finally I realized, okay, if I take breakups as a, as a filter and then I can apply Buddhist principles to that, it, it was, it worked really well. And, and I thought there was a lot of research to go into that. Like I'd take little bits of breakups. Like what about when you're feeling like this, which Buddhist teaching best applies to that? Great. I'd go and study that teaching and get advice from teachers and, and talk about that a bit. And I thought, oh gosh, that's a lot of research. No, <laughs> not compared to this. This was full on. And of course I wanted it to be just perfect and right and meticulous. So there was a lot of cross-checking, tons of cross-checking because different newspaper articles and, you know, would, would have different details and, uh, but I'm very, very lucky because I have a group of older professionals, retired professionals, older homicide detectives, former homicide detectives, and retired forensic pathologists who are very generous with their time, who will help me. And I can phone them. Some of the, they're, they're all in the book. So, yeah. but they they will help me with lots of details and help me, uh, yeah, when I'm confused, which is often and uh, they, they're great teachers so I can phone them or email them even you know meet them and they'll even have me in their homes when we're allowed out of our homes in Melbourne and help me understand or help me you know map things out and of course they've got memories like steel traps so they can remember everything from their own cases or they'll help me understand even things from other cases or just you know so in the end um professor stephen cordner who's the sort of the first chapter in this book he read the whole book for me from cover to cover and just helped make sure that every scientific detail medical detail was correct charlie bazina always helps me with policing details you know, the, the basics, no, Michelle, that's not, that, that wouldn't have happened that way. That's not how we do it. You know, basic concepts. What, what does a brief of evidence look like? He'll show me. How do you fill that stuff out? He'll show me. He'll, he has those things. Coppers keep everything, you know, so he will have. Fascinating. Yeah. This is a police diary. This is what it looks like. This is how you fill it out. This is what you do. So yeah, simple things like that. I'm, I'm really lucky that I've got this brains trust <laughs> yeah. yeah what's your top writing tip and what's your top self-editing tip my top writing tip uh this is quite hilarious when I got my first book deal of course you talk a big game don't you you go yeah 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 of course I can write a book and then you get the deal and then you go how do you write a book so I googled how do you write a book and um, I came up with it. I think the top tip was Hemingway. And it was like, this is, this is how Hemingway reckons you write a book. And his top tip was write a thousand words a day. Get disciplined to write a thousand words a day. And some days there'll be a thousand bad, terrible words, useless. Some days there'll be a thousand great words, most days somewhere in between. But get into that discipline. And so I did. And that's just the best advice I can give anybody. And I still tell everyone that whenever, you know, they're struggling or whatever. So I do that. Write your thousand. Some days you'll be really in the zone and I'll write 3000. Some days I'll be struggling going, oh God, come on. Still only 700. What? But that's what I, I do. Make sure it's always at least a thousand. And yeah, some days there are a thousand crap words you'll never use, but just get into the zone of getting your thousand done. And self-editing, do you find that hard or easy? Depends, I guess, on the day before. It's hard, but then again, I don't even worry about that too much because I have editors and I'm not precious about editing. If they come back and say, we can't really use any of this, I just go, okay, usually. <laughs> I mean, there are very few things, some things I will fight for and I will say, okay, 
I really, I think we really do need this. And this is why, like, I, you have to be very clear about why, and you can't fight for everything. Uh, but, but I do know myself that sometimes I go overboard, like in this book, you know, there's a, I had to include Jamal Khashoggi, you know, because one of the men alleged, I don't even know if I still have to say alleged or if he was convicted yet, I can't remember, but <laughs> to have been part of the Khashoggi murder, uh, studied for three months at VIFM. Well, I mean, I just got so fascinated by that story. I went down such a wormhole. I think I ended up writing about, almost writing half a book about the Khashoggi story and about Jamal Khashoggi and his family and his background and his connections to the Saudi royal family. I just went nuts. And of course they came back and went, um, we probably don't need all of that. Like, like maybe just a couple of paragraphs. I'd probably written 30,000 words about Jamal Khashoggi. So yeah. you. And I knew when I was writing it, I was like, well, this is too much, obviously, but I'll sort of leave it up to them. I love having someone else come in with an overview and letting someone else read it and go, yeah, you know what? We don't need all of that. I don't need all of that to understand the whole thing. I, I quite like that actually. Um, Cause I know I just get very caught up in detail sometimes. Depends. Other people of course hate that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the hardest part about writing um, a crime book? The hardest part about writing a crime book, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I enjoy it so much. Oh, I suppose finding finding people, because I feel as though you need permissions, mm. I don't think you can write the book about people without asking them, basically. So finding people finding, tracking people down is the most time consuming. It's the same with a podcast. It's always tracking people down. Um, yeah, you have to be a bit of a detective. And sometimes, to be honest, I do, I do employ detectives, like sometimes, um, or private investigators, you know, like um, Julia Robson from Chasing Charlie sometimes helps me. I'll, I'll have to contact Julia and say, can you help me? I cannot find this person. And she is such a whiz. She finds them in an afternoon. So yes, sometimes I have to do that. I know other people have researchers and stuff, but I don't. So I, I just have to track people down myself and that can be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Who are your writing inspirations? Hemingway, obviously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, Emily, when I first met Emily, it was because I was doing this other podcast and uh, the Nitty Gritty Committee. And of course, because of my interest in crime, I found it drifting towards, it was just meant to be people I'm interested in talking to. And it was drifting more and more towards true crime. And so I, I wanted to talk to a true crime writer and I had read a few of Emily's books and tracked her down. And I just always liked the way that she uh, talked about victims. She had just a really great attitude and was always victim centric so yeah she's definitely a great writer that way I love her empathy for victims yeah. and the book the five about the victims of uh, Jack the Ripper is just one of my favorite books I, I love it by Hayley um, I'll have to google her name her last name I always forget it but um, amazing book and the whole idea that you know, we don't even know who Jack the Ripper was. And yet he's like this superstar, this revolting industry um, around this killer. And these, the five victims that we know of are just described as drunk prostitutes, yeah. were then and still are. Mm -hmm. and, and this woman goes and, again, does this incredible research. Rubenhold, Haley Rubenhold is her name. Right. This incredible research to find out who these women were and their stories are amazing their stories of survival to that point are incredible most of them if not all had survived and were fleeing domestic violence you know all sorts of things by the time they got to this place in their lives and then and then they and then they were murdered yeah. it's an incredible book that's a great recommendation thank you for that so well written so good 
How do you represent, um, how do you approach representing diverse communities in your writing and your podcasting as well? You know? Yeah, well, you just have to be deliberate, I think. I think you have to be deliberate because the fact is I am a white woman living in Australia and it doesn't come naturally, it just doesn't because of the culture that I come from and have grown up in, it is not naturally represented. And I, I remember years ago going to New Zealand to work on a couple of TV shows there and I was blown away by just the naturalness with which the Murray culture is intertwined. It seems to me, probably New Zealanders will say to me, oh, Michelle, no, it's not. It's not good enough. It's not, you know, but to me. I'm a New Zealander, Michelle. Oh, there and, you go. And, and it is. It's very okay, great. entwined. Very, it's one, great. it's one country. That's what I felt like. And, mm. you know, I was only there a week, but I felt yeah. like, but this, you know, it felt right. Mm. It felt mm. natural and good. And I thought, why, why don't we have this? Why, mm. you know, it felt, it felt appropriate and easy. It felt easy. And yes, so I, I certainly recognize that for us, you have to make the effort. You have to say to yourself, hey, woo, why don't, we're not, we haven't done a, an Indigenous story in a long time, guys. We haven't done a, you know, a story about other communities in a long time. We haven't done that. So, yeah, I think we have to be deliberate. We have to actually have those conversations. We have to map them out. And with the podcast, I'm always trying to be really thoughtful about the episodes anyway, about where they're placed. I try to program them. We try, I try to not have them all too many similar ones in a row and all that stuff anyway so this just has to factor in I just have to try and make sure that that it's part of it I'm sure I fail but we have to be deliberate in this country until such time as it becomes natural yeah you know absolutely mm. how many drafts do you do before handing in your manuscript I do it's hard to I treat every chapter very individually mm -hmm. And uh, so I tend to work and work and work away on a chapter for a long time. And then I tend to f get it to a point where I feel like it's complete before I move on and before I let anyone else see it. So that can frustrate people, the people waiting on me a long time. But then I feel like, yeah, but by the time you get it, it's pretty done. Yeah. You know, so they can feel like, come on, come on. It, you know, when are we going to see something? And I feel like, well, yeah, it's gonna, it takes a while. But then when you see it, it's done. Yeah. So, so that's the good thing. They then when they the editors get it, they go, "Oh my god, it's wonderful!" It's like, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It's like, um, it's like it's finished. It's like we don't have to do anything. I go, yeah. Well, that's why you know that's why it takes. That's why you don't get it till the last minute, like till until uh, the deadline because they, yeah. I think they start to get a bit squirmy because they go, "Oh, we haven't seen anything yet," and I get it from their perspective. They probably think. I hope she's doing something. I hope she's actually doing something. Like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing it. I'm, trust me, I'm doing it. But then I think I have friends who actually weren't doing anything. I have friends who, who you know, had deadlines come and go and they really were not doing anything. But uh, I am doing it and I just like, I feel like, no, it's not ready yet. I don't want you to see it because I know that you'll see it and think that that's, that's what I can do and it's not. I hate that. I hate when people come back and go, um, it's not. And I go, yeah, I know. I'm not finished yet. I hate that. Um, why is true crime so appealing as a genre? Well, you know, that's the big question, isn't it? People ask me that all the time. I know why it's appealing to me. But to me, it's a window into, into our culture, into, and I don't mean that, oh, our culture is violent per se but what I mean is that it just it highlights the problems in systems I always think because I always think that when you look at the lives of offenders and victims and how they come together and I think it tends to highlight systemic failures along the way and that's why it appeals to me because it, it's taught me things that I didn't know it's taught me things about the prison system, the mental health system, the education system, the parole system, it's taught me so many things that I didn't know. Yeah. The, the welfare system and that, 
that is really valuable to me. That's what I like about it. Uh, I agree. It teaches us all, in fact, doesn't it? You know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Also, it's an insight into you know investigators and all of that. But I I also think that in the way that we do it, talking to victims' families, I mean, these people are always so engaging because something about living through violent crime in that way just erases all artifice it just it just presents people in their rawest state makes people really open and really right in your face and I really like meeting people in that way I really so we've met the most amazing people when you when you're talking to people like that it's it's incredible it's an incredible experience yeah what triggers you to write about a particular crime? The people, generally. Generally, it's the people. Like the um, Russells, Carmel and Brian Russell, meeting them, whose daughter Natalie was killed in Frankston. Oh, my God, amazing people. Quite elderly now in their 70s. And just extraordinary, the things they come out with. They're just oh they're like a punch to the gut they're so amazing they're philosophically profound just life-changing the things they say you know yeah that that's what triggers me I think oh I want everyone to know that I want I just want to tell as many people as I can the Maslins things they say I just want to tell everyone what you just said that's the sort of stuff you know and same with the pathologists when you're chatting with a pathologist and they just drop a comment about what what they thought when they were identifying victims of the tsunami like 5,000 victims and they're in Thailand for months and months on end and I just think oh my god I just want to tell everyone what you just said yeah have you ever been threatened about what you're writing? Yes, only once really, only once. And that was uh, interesting. And, and again, one of those moments that makes you proud to do it. Um, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't about something I'd written. I was threatened once about a podcast episode. And that was after a man, most of our guests contact us now. Um, wanting to come on the podcast and talk about their story. This was a man who wanted to talk about his father sexually assaulting him and his siblings when they were children. And he said to me, my father will probably try and like, will probably threaten legal action. He said, this is how he tries to silence us now that we're adults and he can't threaten us physically. It doesn't work with us anymore. So as adults, he tries to threaten us legally and sure enough, his father did, you know, sent us a legal letter. So I was ready and I knew that there was, there was nothing in it. And I knew that as I was editing and as we were recording, we knew that we, would, we weren't doing or saying anything that he could, you know, actually take legal action over. So it's the yeah. only time. Yeah, cool. So we sent back a legal letter <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end. <laughs> what is the hardest thing you've had to write about? The Maslin, the Maslin chapter was yeah. very difficult because I knew I had to send it to them. You know, I knew they were, they were going to read it. So it's really hard to be writing about that. And yeah, just, and then waiting to hear back from them thinking, oh, if I hurt them, it was really hard. Yeah. What's the biggest challenge in true crime writing? The biggest challenge in true crime writing is that that line between too much information and not enough. Yeah. Worrying about being too over the top with the violence, with the with the detail. Uh, certainly, in this book, with the because you know that the audience you know, wants a certain level of detail as well, yeah. Yeah. because why else? And, it, and because it's educational, yeah. I do believe that. I do believe that we want to learn. We want to know certain things. And 
but at the same time, oh, is it just, am I just being graphic for the sake of it? Am I, you know, so yeah, that's the hardest part. Yeah. What started you in a life of crime? Who knows? I was so young. I mean, Emily and I often talk about the fact that we were so young when we started and, and most people I meet, you know, who are interested say the same thing. I don't know how old you were, but yeah. both Emily and I, yeah, yeah, both Emily and I talk about the fact that in primary school, we were getting mm. books out of the library that were true crime books, like Anne yes. Rule books and stuff. Yeah. 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 Funny, I think it was it? the story. Yeah. The stories and the people were fascinating. Mm. Mm. Um, do women write different crime stories to men? I'm not sure. I love I love reading Andrew Rule's work, mm. and I'm a big fan too. I mean, his work is really sensitive and really it's full of facts, but it's also very lyrical and beautifully written. So I think that for me, but then I read other men's <laughs> true crime and it is very kind of, you know, oh, I don't know how to describe it. It's masculine. I mean, it's just very kind of, uh, so I, I do, I, I guess I am drawn toward the men's work that is is lyrical, that is more poetic, I guess is the word I'll use, more yeah. em emotive and yeah more beautiful because yeah. there is beauty in crime there is emotion in true Absolutely. crime yeah. yeah and there are men who write that beautifully yeah and andrew's a brilliant example of oh that. Yeah. absolutely yeah and our final question for today gee time flies when you're having fun yeah. michelle <laughs> yeah how would you get away with murder yeah we do think about that don't we and and i've read once you can't plan the perfect murder. You can accidentally commit the perfect murder, but you can't plan it. And I've always really liked that idea. And I think perhaps the more you know about it, the more you, you know, learn and try to learn about these things, probably the less likely it is that you'd be able to do it. You know, we always read about these people who are Googling <laughs> the week before they murder somebody. How do you murder someone? How do you clean up blood how do you and I think yeah it's probably so yeah I, I meticulous I, planning that then I think that's the, probably worse I think that's probably worse I think probably the harder I tried to plan it the more I'd get caught up in the my plan and then when something didn't work when the person turned around and saw me at the worst moment I'd freak out because my plan was coming undone and I don't know. Uh, I'd like to think that it's a good thing that I don't know how I try and murder somebody. Have you ever watched Mr. In Between? I think it's, I you know, have. No. The hottest. It's the, it's just an amazing show, it's an Australian TV show about a hitman, and um, I've just watched all three seasons. And it's it's about this guy who is is just instinctive. He's just instinctive, and there are you know in moments when when something happens, he just instinctively will change the plan and he'll just do something else and uh you know I'd love to think I could be as instinctive as him if I had to kill someone I'd like to think I'd be as instinctive as Mr in between put it that way but I hope I don't ever have to Michelle Laurie thank you for being with us today sisters in crime on murder Mondays thank you I love sisters in crime thank you